All right, Bridgepoint Church, welcome in, everybody. Uh, you are attending a church, one church in multiple, loca- multiple locations, multiple campuses. And so whether you are in Seminole, you're downtown here in Tyrone, or are at joining us in our online campus, we are so glad that you are here. Happy Sunday, Bridgepoint. How you guys doing? You feeling okay? Good, good, good. Really glad that you are here. This is week three of a series we've been calling When we give. This is a series about how God's expectations for how you and I ought to manage and deal with money and resources and finances. And as much as that tends to stir a little bit of something in our hearts, when we say, yeah, great, we're talking about money in church, I want you to know that we're three weeks in, and I have been so encouraged hearing, uh, hearing uh, testimony from every campus about what God is speaking to each of you through the content of, obviously, his word, the Bible, but this message series, even bigger than just resources, because it's true, the Bible says more about money and how, what we should do with it, how we should spend it, how we should avoid spending it than it does even about faith and prayer combined. Seems pretty important. And so therefore, we're going to talk about it. And we're not only going to talk about it, we're going to celebrate it. And so towards that end, I'm going to jump straight in today. If you find yourself getting stirred in a positive way through this message, I want you to know you can catch up on the other two and see what God might be wanting to speak to you and your family through this, the Bridgepoint app or through our YouTube channel. Uh, You can catch up on this series. I want to start with a question. Seems like a weird question to introduce introduce when we're going to talk about money and resources, but I'm going to do it anyway because I have the microphone. I want to ask you something, and I want it to, to let it stir in your brain as we work through this message content. Again, if you're new, I'm so glad that you're here. We don't always talk about money at Bridgepoint, but we are right now. That's why it's important. So I want to ask you this question. If you're a long timer, I want to ask it to you too, and I want you to consider it. Maybe you find yourself somewhere in between, not even all in on faith, asking questions about faith. Here's an interesting question to consider, all right? Here it is. Do you delight in God? Do you delight in God? Interesting phrasing, chosen on purpose, of course, but do you delight in God? I mean, think about your worship experiences, maybe like we just had. I hope that that was one where you found yourself delighting in the goodness of God. But what about when you show up to the office of the classroom on Monday morning? Are you delighting in God there? (laughs) In your homes with your extended family, even that family member? (laughs) Are you able to delight in God in those moments? with your classmates or your coworkers, you fill in the blank. Do you delight in God? Delight is the idea that that something pleases someone greatly or you receive great pleasure from it. So in your faith journey, whatever that looks like, maybe you're not there yet and you're just asking questions. You're in the right place to ask those questions. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a long, long time. Maybe you find yourself somewhere in between. Do you delight in God? I want you to tuck that question away as we work through today's content because I think it's gonna be really, really helpful. At least it has been for me and some of our team as we've been working through it. Again, the Bible says a lot about what we should do with money and whether we're honoring God with how we use our resources, how we spend them, how we save them, how we invest them, how we give them, how we live generously with them or without them. If you delight in God is a, is a question that's worth processing because of how much the Bible speaks to money. I'll give you some examples, all right? I don't wanna live on any of these verses. I just want you to know some examples of what the Bible says about it. Hebrews chapter 13, verse five It says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content, be content, be content with what you have. For he's talking about Jesus. Jesus has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's an interesting choices about money. Do you delight in God? Are you content with what you have? It's an interesting thought to consider. Proverbs Proverbs chapter 15, it's like a book of wisdom in the Bible. It says, better is a little with the fear of the Lord. That's not fear like being afraid of him. Fear as in reverence or awe or deep respect. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it, right? You know anybody that seems to have everything financially and yet seems so empty in their ongoing life? And there's stories of that all around us, right? Certainly those that we follow on social media or Hollywood or anywhere else. 
What about 1 Timothy? Paul was writing to his protege, Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter six, in verse eight, it says, but if we have food and clothing, with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich, is that you? Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Nothing to be concerned about there, right? That's, that's, I mean, that's speaking deep into the heart about how you and I, I mean, these aren't just people that get wired up and God says, okay, this one's gonna be super rich and make an absolute disaster of their life. Watch it happen. <laughs> it's instead stuff that begins to grow in our heart and, and, and take God's place as the priority in our heart can begin to reorient around the wrong things. And that, that pathway towards sin and self and selfish decision and self-destruction, it never pans out the way sin promises. It leads us on a pathway far from God and far from where we want to be. And, and Paul kind of summarizes it for Timothy, just the next verse when he says, for the love of money, make sure you note the difference. It's the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I mean, we, we probably know folks that have that testimony, right? Things started to go really well, and the more things went well in and of their own strength, the less they depended upon their, their faith and the only Savior that really exists. And, and how quickly we go down that pathway until we wake up. We talked about this in the prodigal's, uh, uh, the father and his two sons, the prodigal son, woke up like, how on earth did I even get here? leads us down pathways we don't want to go. And in light of all of those teachings, again, I don't want to camp on any one of those. I want to, I want to go to something that actually Paul wrote in Corinthians is where I want to live today. But as I was preparing for this message, I saw a quote by an early church father. So like a, a very spiritual, God-loving man that lived a long, long time ago, St. Augustine. And as I was prepping for this one, this quote really jumped out to me. And with all that the Bible says about money and all of our perspective related to money, I just thought, man, this is a quote that really leads us into today's content in a really beautiful way, I think. It's a heavy hitter, takes a few moments. If you, if you think on my level, it'll take us a few times to read it to, Ilya, to really understand it. So track with me. St. Augustine said this, I was still eagerly aspiring to honors, money, and matrimony. Those were his goals for life, right? He's talking to God and he says, you, God, did mock me. I was aspiring those things and you, God, mocked me. In pursuit of these ambitions, I endured the most bitter hardships in which you, God, look what he says, were being the more gracious, the less you would allow anything that was not you to grow sweet to me. You see what he's saying there? That one just struck me. Because I think there's something in us, especially in our American culture, where we have a drive. If you're driven, and I'm a driven guy, there's a drive in me that I want to pursue. I want to pursue being the best. And there's nothing innately wrong with that. Honors and money and matrimony. And oftentimes, even in our faith journey, and I've had moments where this was my story, where it's like, God, why are you mocking me? Why are you punishing me? God, why are you holding back from me as I'm trying to do these things to honor you and live out who you made me to be? And it feels like, God, you're mocking me. It's bitter. It's hard. It, we're left with questions. Why, God? Why not, God? Why this, God? Why not that, God? And St. Augustine learned, and this is one of those moments where as he looked back on his life, what came into the picture was, you were being so gracious, the less you would allow anything that was not you to grow sweet to me. And, and how about a series on money where we pause right here to ask ourselves, are there prayers that you've prayed? Because I know I've been guilty of this. Are there prayers that you have prayed where you look back now and say, thank you, God, you didn't answer that one with a yes right? You'd probably be married to somebody different, right? Good Lord, that'd have been a mess. Amen? Don't say that out loud. Could, could have been a job that you look back saying, man, I'm thankful that I didn't end up there. Could have been a life circumstance, a relocation. 
Could have been a friend group or an investment that you look back on. It's like, thank you, God, that you didn't say yes to that which I begged you for. Middle school, high school students, you've been there. You know what I'm talking about, right? You're looking back on some of those things like, yeah, I for sure thought she was the one, but she wasn't. College students and young professionals, you, you've, you've had some of those prayers where you look back now and it's like, man, I'm, I'm really glad God redirected my path because I don't like where I was headed. But man, I cried out. I cried out, God, please, please, God. But how often do you look back And maybe I need to ask myself this, even as a pastor, at some of those prayers to say, thank you, God. Because though I was bitter towards you, angry towards you, at what felt like you being so distant or so mean to me, that in all actuality, God, was you protecting me from anything growing in my heart? that would be a lesser story for my life than you, God. Have you looked back on your journey like that? Because maybe uh, maybe it's appropriate in a series about finances and, and how we spend them and what we do with them to take a little time out in the quest of all the things we're praying for to also then have a moment where we look back at the things we have prayed for and just say, thank you. Thank you that you gave me a hard no. Thank you that you felt silent. And even though it hurt back then, I'm looking back saying, oh God, you protected me. He saved me yet again from myself, from my own desires, from my own ways. Thank you, God, that you prevented that so that it's you that could continue to grow as the sweetest of sweets, delight of delights, in my heart. Do you delight in God? Do I? Here's the point today, and I want to shift into kind of where we're going to land today in one of Paul's letter, but I'll give you the big idea to be processing as we work through it. The point of today's message is this, cheerfulness in giving. Cheerfulness in giving reflects delight in the heart. Cheerfulness in giving. I'll help this make sense in just a minute with some of Paul's words, not my own. But cheerfulness in our giving reflects delight in the heart. That's why I want us to be considering uh, whether or not you and I delight in God. Do we receive pleasure from him? Are we grateful to him? Is, Is he our source? Is he what grows sweet in our heart? Is he the King of kings and Lord of lords in our heart's posture? And here's why I ask that. Because a lot of the times when we start talking about money, what we quickly begin to bend into is this idea that God is expecting something from me, that he needs my money. And we quickly move away from the truth that we know in every other facet of our being, that we sing about and celebrate and express praise to God. God is a giver. That's who he is. And he gives from his heart of love toward you and towards me. And I'll say it again, as this is the third time in this series, God is a giver and his, he desires to give the best gifts to you. That's why he sent a rescue plan. That's why Jesus came as God in human flesh to rescue us from ourselves, from our sin and from the destructive pathways we were on to start a new journey in a new life towards new purpose, walking in his ways and not our own. But do we still view him as cheerful? Do we still view responding to him as cheerful? Do we still see it as something we can cheerfully do when he invites us to trust him in all facets of our lives, to delight in him with everything that we are, including, but not limited to, our wallets? I think a lot of the times that's where we begin to get off course because whether whether we view it as like, well, this is where God probably wants something from me, or whether we say, well, I know that God is a giver, 
and I only have so much resources, so I trust that God would want me to get something that's going to make me happy, right? He does want me to be cheerful. He does want to give good gifts to me. Maybe I need to help him out and say, I mean, he would understand why I have to cheat the church a little bit. I have to cheat being generous. I have to cheat the hurting or the needy a little bit so that I can get the stuff that I need or want for self-care or gratification or, or just living out the fact that he gave me this job and I've deserved this. I earned this money, right? And how quickly do we move our eyes off of delighting in God and instead delighting in the things we get from God, which aren't the same. Just yesterday, I had the opportunity. My son was uh, out playing uh, with a friend for the day. He was at the park. And so I got to take my daughter. She's about to wrap up first grade, Juliet, on a daddy-daughter date and daddy-daughter afternoon. Uh, Mommy got the day to herself. Judah got the day with a friend. It was me and Juliet. And we went to a new restaurant and she loved it. She loved it. Couldn't stop talking about it. We were having the best time. We went home. We were doing stuff that she enjoyed. Uh, we were, ha- I mean, it was a blast. We were having the best day. And we get all the way to the end of the day. And I'm thinking, man, I have made up a lot of ground relationally with this girl. Not that things were bad. She's in first grade. But I'm like, man, I'm king of the castle right now. Until I asked her at bedtime, hey, who do you want to tuck you into bed tonight? You want daddy or mommy? And she said, without skipping a beat, answering way too fast, in my opinion, she said, oh, I want mommy because she's the best. (laughs) And I was like, I know mommy's the best, but didn't we have a good day? And she's like, well, we did until you fussed at me about that one thing. I corrected her behavior, deservedly so, one time. And that was enough for her to take all of the joy we had that day and turn it to saying, oh, I need mommy for this one. She's the best. And after I finished crying and pouting and being angry about it, I just thought how quickly when God doesn't come through exactly the way I want with what I want or who I want or where I want or when I want in my life, How quickly do I move away from the cheer and delight of enjoying him as the God of my life to being so frustrated that he wouldn't come through for me the way that I wanted it to? And I wonder, I wonder how many other folks, that's your story too. That's why I ask, cheerfulness in giving reflects delight in the heart. Do you delight in God? Here's why I say that. I want to go to Paul's word, 2 Corinthians. We're going to camp there for just a few minutes as I start working towards the end of the message. Paul said this, and I think what he was saying, though he was speaking to an agrarian society, I think it's going to track for every single one of us. And I hope that it challenges you in the most delightful way, in the same way that it's challenged me. 2 Corinthians was the letter Paul was writing. We know it again in our Bibles as the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. And Paul's talking about provision and resources for the early church that they were living out their faith in a new way in light of Jesus's death and resurrection and what it meant for the world. And then Paul said this, and I think it's pretty clear. Let me jump straight to it. The point is this, Paul said, whoever, that would be you, that would be me, anybody that follows Jesus and is is pursuing him as, as the king of their lives. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's just a principle of planting, right? But it makes sense in all aspects and all phases of our lives. If we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. That's just science. It's the way the world works. And then Paul said this, each one, this is, so this is you and this is me, each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. So maybe the space to live into this is is here for just a second. And I don't want to stay here too long, but it does bring up a couple important questions. The first is this, are you a giver? Are you a giver? And by that, Paul's talking about related to the local church and investing in the kingdom work that God is doing. Are you a giver? Because what was, what was a reality for Paul is that each one must give. 
Each one must give. That's how the mission of God moves forward. Every major movement of God often involves the people of God moving alongside him and investing in it. God works through his people. So the question for Paul wasn't whether or not you and I felt like we needed to give. That was the command of Jesus is that we would trust God with our resources. And I wonder if the caution there for some of us, myself included, is that selective obedience to God's word isn't obedience. That's just living out of convenience. Each one must give. Each one must give. The question today is, am I trusting God fully in my heart? Because if I'm delighting in him, then sometimes I will do things out of obedience, even when I don't feel like it, right? You will too. That's a principle of parenting. Sometimes I don't need my kids to like the decision I've made. They just need to obey it. And it may cost me being able to tuck them in, but I'm delighted when they obey. And sometimes if we're trying to base our faith on only doing what feels right to us, be incredibly careful because our hearts are incredibly deceitful. Sometimes we do the things that God has asked us to to do because he asked us to do them. But the beauty of following Jesus is he's not a God of just do the rules because I said so. He's a God that has, that gives us boundaries to our lives that are for our good. That's why Paul said, give as he's decided in his heart, jumping to the end of that very sentence, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, the difference there is one is out of obedience. We obey him because we love him. It's the right thing to do. One is moving to a space where we're not operating out of religiosity or obligation. We operate out of a space of delight. Because when we find ourselves doing things that express our love for God, God's desire is that we might be filled so with his love that we take delight in honoring him with the things that we don't naturally want to do. That's what being a cheerful giver means. And here's why I think God invites us into this space. Skipping ahead to the next verse, verse eight. And God, don't miss this, because maybe this is the very reason God brought you here today is to hear this verse. God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. In other words, we don't give so that we can get God's grace. We give because we've received God's grace. And when we've received God's grace, it changes our outlook on all of life. Because when I think about what I deserve in my life, the patterns and pathways that I've walked that have led me down paths of destruction and despair, and the reality that God in his goodness would still choose to step into my world just as he has yours to put me on a new path, man, I'm delighting in the fact that God would love me just as much as he loves you and redirect my pathway. And the beauty of that, what I get redirected to is I'm redirected to a pathway of grace. That in other words, what God has called me into, he will provide enough grace for me to accomplish. And what God is calling you to step out of and into, he will provide grace for you there too. God doesn't call people that have it all together. God begins to show grace to people that are stepping out of their mess and into his new life. That's the beauty of grace. And what this verse is teaching us you nor I can outgive God. We can't outgive God. And so with our resources, when scripture is clear that we need to be investing and trusting God with our wallets, that's an invitation for God to say, why don't you just see what I'll do with my grace when you follow me in obedience to my plan for your life? And there's not going to be a moment that we think, well, I I hope God's ready for this because I'm about to back up a truck for him and we'll just see what he has. There's not going to come a moment where God's like, oh man, they have just stumped me. Instead, I wonder if God looks down at his children saying, man, look at how they're delighting in what I've invited them into. 
that he says, now I've got grace for their next. I've got grace for their mistakes. I've got grace for their addictions. I've got grace for their brokenness. I've got grace for my plans for their lives. I've got grace upon grace for them that if they'll trust my plan, they'll discover that I've equipped them to walk in my purpose. And here's why he says that. Skipping ahead of verse, verse 10, Paul wrote it this way. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. And then he says, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. When you and I reach a place where we're willing to trust him with our resources, even if that trust is just rooted in obedience, then God's promise to us is the more we'll walk in his plans, the more we'll discover his grace to walk in our purpose. And the more you walk in grace, the more we look back at where we were and praise God that we're not who we used to be, the more we discover the grace to continue to step into what's next. And the more we reach a place where we view the world through gratitude to God, thanksgiving to him for not allowing to happen to us what we deserved, but instead doing a new thing in a new way in our lives, it frees us to live a life of generosity that is delighting in God's goodness instead of trying to hold back to our, onto our control. It's delighting in him. It's delighting in, in what he's given and who he is. And then God promises something through Paul when he says, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all, uh, for all others. In other words, Paul was promising that a world that's desperate to find hope in a world that's desperate to find grace and forgiveness in a world that's longing for acceptance and belonging, trying to find themselves in, the, in all the wrong places and all the wrong ways. The promise from Paul is that God Almighty will work through your obedience and mine, and he'll work doubly so through my delight in him and yours, that a lost world will see our delight in God and want to experience his grace too. In other words, in other words, today, this afternoon, when we head down to the pier and see over 50 people from Bridgepoint Church be baptized, <clears throat> wait, 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 hold on, hold on, that was not good enough. <clears throat> in other words, when we head down to the pier later this afternoon to see over 50 people from Bridgepoint Church be baptized, <laughs> Those 50 people that have made the personal decision to trust Jesus to take them from death to life and walk in his new ways, what it means is that you and I remind ourselves God allowed us to play a tiny part in their story. God allowed us to be a part of what he's doing through our church family and the other churches that will join at the pier today. God allowed us. He used somebody like me to reach somebody like those 50 folks. We've got somebody from every single campus, including our online campus today. And all that reflects is the reality that when you and I are willing to say, God, I don't always understand it. God, I don't always feel like I'm, I, I should. God, I, I don't always feel like I can, but I'll trust you with my dollars. Those dollars execute a mission in this place where God is at work and 50 people today are benefiting from your investment. But it also means that every time you serve, every time you hold a door and smile at someone new, 
Every time you invest yourself in the next generation back in Kids Point or BP Youth or BP Young Adults, every time you're willing to lead a group, make production happen, or use your skills in the band, every time you give of yourself into a kingdom mission and a kingdom purpose, Paul's promise is that God will use people like you and people like me. In other words, God will use imperfect people to execute his perfect plan. And what Pinellas County needs to see is a church that's saying, God, I don't always get it, but I'm always gonna trust you. And as I trust you, I can't wait to see what you have in store for my neighbor and my classmate, for my coworker and my family member, for the person down the street and the person at the store. And God, I'm gonna trust trust you to do a new thing that changes people from the inside out. And God will use you and God will use me. Amen. So the invitation then today is to remind ourselves of the point of this and ask ourselves a good question. Do I delight in God? Do you, that he saved you? remade you, pulled you out of the pit and gave you new life and a new purpose because cheerfulness in giving reflects delight in the heart. And if we can't outgive, then I, I think this is biblical. I triple dog dare you to try. Try to outgive God and see what delight bubbles up in your heart to know that 50 people's eternity is forever changed because of the church family that you and I are a part of. And the more that delight floods our heart, at least according to the writer of Psalms, it's biblical, it's true, Psalm 37, four. And I'll leave you with this. It says this, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That the more we delight in him, the more we discover that he is everything our weary hearts have been longing for and needing from the beginning. That's why the invitation today is not to step into obligation. It's not to step into burden. It's not to step into, oh, the pastor said I should. The invitation today is to not settle in your story or mine for a lesser story but instead to discover that there is something powerful at stake when we give. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Would you pray with me? God, would you make us those people? And God, the first step for many of us especially those of us that haven't been living into the rhythm of giving, of trusting you with our wallets and our finances, of of tithing that 10% or whatever we are able to the church. God, that first step may need to be out of obedience, but God, obeying you reflects our love for you. So let's start there. God, we want to honor you in obedience, but God, our desire and your promise is that the more we're willing to step into your plans, the more our hearts can delight in your goodness. And God, what our hearts need is so much more of you because this world doesn't cut it. God, thank you for all the prayers that we've prayed that you didn't answer. And God, the more we delight in you, May we discover that you answer the ones that we need that allows you to grow sweeter in our hearts and nothing else, nothing else will do. Yes, we will, God, step into obedience. And yes, we will, God, grow in delighting in your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me